please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21. And we'll be considering the last few verses in this glorious gospel, verses 14 through 25. It's been quite a ride for me personally to walk through the gospel of John verse by verse, chapter by chapter. It's amazing, and, and I just recall again that a number of occasions where I've pointed people to the Gospel of John as being the way by which they can learn who God is by encountering the Lord Jesus through the, the pen of John. And, you know, oftentimes we talk about the, the inspired pen. Well, the, technically it is the words that they wrote that are inspired. That's the God-breathed, the Anustas scripture. And uh, we all, as as Christians, especially here at Syracuse Baptist Church, we, we take for granted that whenever we read the Bible, we're reading inspired words that God has breathed out and men, as carried along by the Spirit, wrote down so that we could know who God is, who we are truly, and to understand rightly the, the world around us. This passage today is also a passage of hope. Hey, hope. Well, that's why she's named Hope. She gives us hope of restoration. And again, as we know from studying, studying Bible study, that this was written by John to a specific audience. The conversation is from Jesus to Peter. But who is it for? Us. It is written for us. So here we have the tail end of John, Peter, at this point is still dejected. He's still in remembrance of his denial of Christ. He knows he blew it. And I think this has great, great application to any of us here this morning who is dejected and you know you've blown it. So let's read our passage and dive right in. Beginning in verse 15. <clears throat> So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love, love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you to where you do not wish to go. Now he said this, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? Well, Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. And yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know his testimony is true. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. So after that miraculous and no doubt delicious fish breakfast by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus and Peter take a walk. Now, how do we know they're taking a walk? Well, because of 
Verse 20, Peter turns around and sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Now, I'll ask you, have you ever been in the situation where you know there's probably some tension between you and your better? You know, in the, in the right sense, maybe your boss or your dad or your uncle or something. And, and you've just eaten a meal or hung out and, and uh, the one leaves, oh, let's take a walk. And your, your heart sinks because you know, oh, no, what I do this time. <laughs> I have no doubt that that's probably what's going on. And on this walk, Jesus is purposefully asking certain questions and emphasizing truths to Peter. Basically, he's asking the same question three times. So when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter responds and says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. That's the first of the three questions. And, and this is, I'm putting under the heading of shepherd, shepherd my sheep. One thing we notice right away is that Jesus uses Peter's pre-disciple name. Remember when Jesus called Peter, he said, you're Simon Barjona, or the son of John, Simon Barjona, but I call you Peter, Cephas. Jesus called him the rock when he, when he called him to follow him. And now he's back to his old name, Simon. I think there's any, any indication there as to where Peter's at, of course. Was he a rock when he called down curses upon himself when the little girl asked him? <laughs> oh, no. He was wavering, anything but a rock. So when Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these? There, there's honestly different ways that you can take that in, in the Greek language and in the English. And we basically have three options. The first option would be, Peter, do you love me more than these stuff, this stuff, these things, your, your boat, your nets, your fishing gear, your tackle, all the stuff that you make your living with? When I was a kid, my parents were in a gospel group called the Jubileers. This was the late 60s, early 70s. They had a little trailer with the band name on. They had two, two records they had recorded. And this was in the heyday of the Gaither Trio. Bill and Gloria Gaither. Gloria, I don't know how she did it, but she could make herself cry at just the right time every concert they ever gave. It's a skill, I believe, that she worked on. Actually, we saw them. Uh, my, my parents opened up for them, I think a couple times, down at, uh, at once at Road Heaver. No, at the Billy Sunday Tabernacle with sawdust on the floor. What a night. And one of the songs that the Jubileers performed that my dad sang the solo is Lovest Thou Me More Than These. I just heard a version of it on YouTube. It's, it's kind of what you'd expect, very slow and sentimental, emotive. It's trying to bring out that, aren't you ashamed that you love stuff more than Jesus? Here's the first verse. Modern times have brought us many blessings. People live in wealth and luxury. But the master asks this question, lovest thou me, lovest thou me more than these? Now, is that true? Yeah, we're not to love anything more than we love Jesus. But it's not what this passage is talking about, I don't believe. Notice in Peter's response, he doesn't say, yes, Lord, you know that I love you more than these. He just says, you know that I love you. So that, that is an option. I don't, I, I don't quite think that's it. The second we would say, do you love me more than these six guys you just went fishing with? Or remember, Jesus had told them to go and wait for him on the mountain. So are, the, are they waiting for Jesus on the mountain? No. Peter says, you know what? I'm going fishing. And everyone said, us too. 
They're supposed to be on the mountain. So maybe, maybe Peter's allegiance is to his buddies and helping them make a little money on a weekday morning. <clears throat> Here's the third option. Do you love me more than these love me? I think that's probably what's, what's being emphasized. What, why do I think that? Well, remember, Peter was pretty quick on the draw when it came to, oh, they'll leave you, but not me. Back in, in Matthew 26, this is verse 33, Jesus said, you will all fall away on account of me. And what does Peter say? Even though... All may fall. Uh uh. Because of you, I will never fall away. Kind of reminds me of the, the passage in 1 Kings. Don't, don't brag in putting on your armor in the same way that the guy does taking it off. In other words, putting on your armor, getting ready for battle is one thing. But being able to say, yeah, we stood tall as you're taking your armor off. That's a different thing entirely. Luke 22, 32. Uh, Jesus, <clears throat> after he said that Simon, uh, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. And he says, I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and death. So Peter's really hot on the, here's what I'm going to do. I'm, uh, I'm able to do it. Even though all the other disciples, not me. And see, now everyone knows of Peter's failure. John was there. But now everyone's going to know about Peter being restored. And that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> now, much has been written about the types of word that's used for love in, in Jesus's asking of the question, do you agape me? And Peter responds, you know that I phileo you. That's where we get the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia, phileo. And agape is that kind of full thought through, heartless or heartfelt giving of oneself. But to be honest, and that used to be where the commentators would, you know, plant their flag a little bit. It's all about the response of the words. Well, actually, you can use those words pretty interchangeably. I mean, Jesus used phileo when he says, as the Father loved the Son. Well, we would think that was anything less than full affection, full commitment either. There's many times, if you, if you do a word study using any Bible software, and phileo and agapeo really used interchangeably quite a bit. So I don't think the issue is with the words. I think the issue is in Peter's three denials and then his three reaffirmations of his affection, his commitment, his love for the Lord Jesus. So the first time it's Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And what does Jesus say? Okay, if you love me, Tend my lambs. Feed the little ones. Peter is going to be martyred. We've, we've, we read that in our passage. Jesus knows this. And he says, you love me? Here's what your responsibility is. Feed my little ones, my lambs. And the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep. Shepherd, that's, that's used as a verb. It's, it's usually used to indicate the shepherd as a noun. This is in the sense of shepherding as an action that the shepherd does. Guide, guide these sheep. If you've ever been around sheep, you know that they're pretty much like grown-up furry lemmings, mindless Dolts who need the rod and the staff of the shepherd to guide them where they should go. I, I'm glad that you know we're the sheep of his pasture, not the cows of his um, fenced-in pen, because cows are even dumber than sheep, it seems. But 
were sheep. And then the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And all of this, think, think of where Jesus is taking Peter. You're an apostle, Peter. You blew it, Peter. And yet, I have this job for you to do that starts small and grows into a mountain that crushes everything. The kingdom of God. You're the one who's going to start this. And your motivation must be what? Love for Jesus. We could put in, we, as, as just fallen creatures, we could say, well, if you're going to do that kind of job, you've got to have tenacity. You've got to have, you've got to set your face like a flint. You've got to be one of those Old Testament prophets. You've got to have courage. But Jesus says the basis of all of that is love for Christ, love for God. This is the, the prime motivation of, of anyone who's going to do the work of the Lord. Not only is it not easy, but it can be downright discouraging at times. And how about this? It's got to be the prime motivation if you're going to follow Christ wholeheartedly. Love for Jesus. Think of Peter. You know I love you. Even though three weeks ago, I just demonstrated the opposite of all of my arrogant braggadocio. Oh, I'll never fall. And at this third question, Peter is grieved. The text says Peter was grieved that he asked him a third time. But Jesus is what we would say. He's like a skilled surgeon. And he's, he's cutting right down to get all of the disease out of there. It should remind us, too, that just because someone is grieved doesn't mean it's good or bad or anything. We're so concerned with people's feelings and, you know, trigger warning and all that stuff. And there's no sense in being offensive. Jesus isn't being offensive, but he's saying exactly what he knows is going to bring Peter to this point of, okay. Peter adds this to his answer. Because he's going to say, you know that I love you. But he first says, Lord, you know all things. Lord, you know my heart. I have nothing to stand on. I'm an abject failure. But you know me. He's appealing here to Jesus' sovereignty over the situation, over his own life, over his heart, his knowledge. And of course, Jesus knows all of this going into it. Do you love me? As if, as if he didn't know. It's, this is all to pull this out of Peter. And Jesus still commissions cry, or, uh, Peter to tend my sheep. Lord, you know everything. You know my heart. Yeah, tend my sheep. Here's the thing. In this passage we have to assume that Peter is totally repentant or else Jesus wouldn't be restoring him. And I think it's in the passage, Lord, you know all things, you know I love you. And he doesn't try to tell Jesus what he's, what he's going to do to make up for his denial. He doesn't try to go back to something maybe he said earlier in their ministry that would have weighed the balance, you know, denial. But yeah, but you remember I did this over here. Isn't, it, isn't that how this works? No. He doesn't say what he plans to do either. He, he's guilty. He denied his friend. And, and this, this kind of reminds me, I don't want to take off too far on a rabbit trail. Mark, what is it? Uh, uh, chase, capture, kill, clean, consume. I like that. That's good. This will, be a, this will be a quick little meal for me up here. There have, been, there have been pastors that we all know that fell by either denying Christ by what they said or did, by sexual failures is usually the thing. And it seems like the, the first thing people want to do is, is restore them to their office. And it, I think this is absolutely risky business to even begin to think about. Um, no, the, the, the issue isn't make sure they're a pastor again because 
historically, even in our own remembrance, we can think of men, think of Jimmy Swagger and his tearful apology that, that really got, you know, got him a lot, of, a lot of street cred with the Christians. But what was his response to his, his denomination's discipline? If Jimmy Swagger would have been truly repentant, he would have said, I'm willing to walk through this. I've put myself under the authority of these guys before, and I'm going to continue to do it now, and I'm going to obey what they think. But no, he said, nope, God's work needs me. And he left the assemblies of God and made his own thing. Is that repentance? No. Tuli and Javidjan, just five years ago, caught in sexual infidelity and lies. And did he put himself under the eldership, the presbyterial form that the PCA has? No. No, he left that and started his own church after he got remarried. That's not repentance. And, I, and I'm friends with a guy right now who, because of something five years ago that was repented of and just came to light recently, he's actually walking through this with his elders. And he thinks it's a little slow, but he's not going to break out like a calf and go run off into something else. He's, he's actually repenting fully. And I found this, this quote from uh, Nicholas Batsik just, just over the weekend. I thought it was really good. I want to read it. A minister may ignore the needs of his own soul by so investing himself in the busyness of ministry. In turn, he will not be in a place to truly care for the people of God. Pastors may be put on a pedestal in a way that overshadows Jesus Christ, the only king and head of the church. Additionally, pastors and elders can err in any number of decisions that they make. Even with a plurality of elders, church leaders will make mistakes and fail to act in the wisest manner possible, even falter at times. Pastors are sinners with finite wisdom. There is only one sinless shepherd, and nonetheless, God has appointed pastors to care for the flock by faithfully ministering his word leading them in prayer and administering the sacraments to them. There's a word that Jesus has used three times so far that we dare not miss, and that's feed my sheep. Christians belong to Jesus, not to a pastor or elders. We belong in membership to a local church, but Jesus is the shepherd the apostles were under shepherds. How much more are guys like me just under, under shepherds of Jesus Christ? It just reminds me of, of another apostle who had to be <laughs> brought to his apostleship, probably literally kicking and screaming. He said something about kicking against the goads, the apostle Paul. And he wrote this to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 28. Be on your guard for yourselves and for the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. It's Jesus' church. Peter knows this. Peter is an apostle of the Lord Jesus, and Peter's one of those foundation stones that now we as a church are built upon, the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Here we are, built upon that solid rock, not of Peter as a pope, but of Peter and John and Barnabas and all the apostles as those sent ones by the Lord Jesus. In fact, you know, early on in John, we were talking about Nicodemus, and I said, well, don't worry, he comes out okay later. Well, the same thing with Peter, he comes out okay later too. In his first letter, his first epistle, chapter five, he writes this, as your fellow elder, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. So yes, these are, these are my sheep, Jesus says, and I want you, Peter, and by extension, all apostles, to shepherd, to tend the flock of Christ. J.C. Ryle said this was meant to teach Peter and the whole church 
this mighty lesson that usefulness to others is the grand test of love. You catch that. It's not the basis of his ministry, but his shepherding the flock would be where love is manifested. Love is brought forth for all to see. Working for Christ, the great proof of really loving Christ. It's not loud talk and high profession. It's not even impetuous, spasmodic zeal and readiness to draw the sword and fight. It just reminds me, draw the sword. <laughs> Peter's so zealous that he cut Malchus's ear off and later on, one of Malchus's relatives said, hey, didn't I see you in the garden? No. So it's not that. It is this. It is steady, patient, laborious effort to do good to Christ's sheep scattered throughout this sinful world, which is the best evidence of being a true-hearted disciple. So shepherd my sheep. That's Jesus's Question and answer, his response to, to Peter's, yes, I love you, feed my sheep. So now, having recommissioned Peter, he goes on to tell Peter about his future. I appreciate what, what Bob prayed before the offering. We, we'd like to know the future, but we don't, so we know the one who does, and that's how we can not go crazy. We trust God. Jesus says this, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God, by which he would glorify God. And when he spoke in this, he said to him, yet again, follow me. Yes, Jesus really does quote, know all things. Even the time and the method by which Peter was going to glorify God in his death. This is my second point in our outline. This is sovereign. Jesus is, is God in the flesh. He is sovereign over these things. Indeed, the Gospel of John was probably written after Peter's martyrdom. Because he says this was to indicate what kind of death. And church history tells us something about Peter and his ministry. And after serving and planning churches and serving churches, he ended up going to Rome. And there was this emperor there who was known commonly as the beast. Who am I talking about? Nero. Nero was nuts. His own, his own people referred to him as the beast. He's the one who would light his garden party with people like you and me. And history says, yes, Peter was indeed crucified under Nero. And Jesus is saying here to Peter, you know, you're going to be old. You're not old now. You're going to be. But after a long and fruitful service of feeding my sheep, as led by the Spirit, when you're old, you're not going to dress yourself. Someone's going to dress you. Well, that, that word for girded there can indicate a, a binding of sorts. So, so when I get dressed, I don't, I don't want to bind myself. I want loose, billowy clothing. So does anyone. But Jesus is saying, at the end of your life, someone else is going to bind you and gird you and will stretch out your hands. That would be in the, in the idiomatic language. When we say, you're going to go to the chair, what does that mean? You're going to get executed. It's the same type of thing. Stretch out your hands. That was a common way of euphemizing you're going to be crucified. So the choice, Peter, at the end of your life is still going to be do you love me? You can, you can demonstrate your love for me or you can deny me. Love or denial. And Peter's death will ultimately glorify God. 
Now I know it's, it's difficult to conceptualize this. We, Jason, we were talking the other night about how pleasant it is to dwell in this part of the country. There's not a, we don't, we don't see what's going on in Portland. We're not being, you know, our, our church doors aren't being padlocked and fences put around. You don't dare come in here. There are places in the Western world where we're seeing this kind of judgment take place. And God doesn't call all of his apostles and ministers and servants to a martyr's death. What does he call us to? Be faithful no matter what it is. Philippians 1, 20 and 21, Paul writes this. According to my earnest expectation and hope, I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. We know the next verse. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Yes, Peter's death will glorify God. How does it glorify God? Well, first of all, Peter's total submission to the Lordship of Christ his trust in Christ, all based on his love for Christ, taking the gospel to a place where they hate Christ. You know, much, much has been said about Calvin's Geneva and how I, I joke around that I wouldn't have been welcome there because I'm a Baptist. But did you know that there were a long, there was a long train of missionaries that left Calvin's Geneva and headed where? South into Italy, into where Roman Catholicism was everything. They, they marched to their death, knowing that taking the, the gospel, the saving gospel, justified by grace alone, through faith alone, to the glory of God alone, by the work and person of Christ alone, that that was gonna bring not just opposition, but probably torture and death. And yet, on they marched. And so this, this passage here ends where it began. In Matthew 4, where, where Simon, son of John, Simon Barjona, first called, Jesus says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And here it ends with, follow me going to be a fisher of men. So in this passage, Jesus gives a, a forecast, as it were, of the hatred and opposition of the world. And in those three do you love me questions, he lets Peter and all of us know that the only way to fight, to combat, and to overcome was in love for Christ above all. Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Only this could give that necessary tenderness and resolve to do what God has called. That applies to Peter, the apostle, that applies to me as a pastor, and applies to you as Christians. So no matter what, follow Jesus. Let's conclude the passage in our sermon this morning. Peter, turning around, verse 20, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back on his bosom at the summer and said, Lord, who is the one betrayed you? So he's talking about himself there. John is saying, Peter looks back and sees me. So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Right? Jesus just told Peter, you're going you're gonna to die a martyr's death. Well, what about him? Isn't that typical? And Jesus says, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that the disciple would not die. And yet Jesus did not say to him that he wouldn't die, but only if I want him to remain, what is that to you? So we know this is John. And I, this is a great example to don't worry about him. You worry about you. You follow me. If I want this, if I've commissioned you to do something, Jesus is saying, if I've given you a task and responsibility... And it's not the same as that, guys. 
Mind your own business. What, where, does that, where does that kind of question come from? Well, I don't want to get too psychoanalytical about it, but it's, it's a little bit selfish, isn't it? You know, well, I have to die. What about him? I'm going to die a martyr's death, but what about John? And see, Jesus, again, exercising his sovereignty, if it is my will that this remain, now that's from the King James, from New International Version, New, New American Standard, you know, if, if I desire, but it really is about if it's my will that this is for him and I don't do the same for you, how is that relevant? Nobody said this was easy. Nobody said that it was fair, equitable. There's no respecter of persons with Christ. He may, he may call any one of us to do something that the other person has no clue about, no abilities in. We shouldn't worry about those things. He gives gifts as he wills. And there's another great example here. It's a lesson for all of us. Be accurate in the truth. How, how much is that you know, going on? Oh, oh, you said this, so therefore you mean this. That's how these rumor mills get started. It's almost like there was a rumor started amongst the disciple that, hey, did you hear? John's not going to die. He's going to live and keep living and get to be an old man and enjoy food and comfort and shelter at the end of his life. That's not what Jesus said at all, was it? It was if it's, if it's my will that he remain. So God calls each to be faithful regardless of what anyone else is doing. And I, I think that's clear from the passage. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. And then John ends his entire letter. This is the disciple who was testifying to these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. This is, this is taking the form here of a solemn oath. Solemn. He's saying, I'm, I'm saying this is true. And John Gill writes this, the testimony of one that was an eye and ear witness as John was, of all that he testified and wrote, all that must be known, all that must be owned, all that must be allowed by all to be true, firm, and unquestionable. Therefore, the apostle speaks in the plural number as being not only his own sense, but, th but the sense of all who would follow Christ. In other words, this is the disciple, and we know his testimony is true. How do you know that God's testimony is true this morning? You ever, you ever wonder about that? Isn't that also part of Christ's sovereignty over your life? You can grow up in a household where you know it's true and your twin brother could care less. What's the difference? Was the difference because you're smarter than him or better? No, it's because if I will, it, it's up to Christ. Ultimately, we know this is true because God has revealed it to us. Yet we ought to remember that what we formally stated, that the summary which the evangelists have committed to writing is sufficient both for regulating faith and for obtaining salvation. This is John Calvin writing about this revelation of John. He tells us in verse 25, he explicitly says what we've been saying the whole time. John does not intend to give us the exhaustive life story of everything Christ ever said or did. He explicitly says, it's not all here. It's not intended to tell us everything. Rather, its intent is to make known and manifest the glory of God's unique one and only Son, the monogamous, the single begotten, the only begotten. It's, it's such a weird word to capture. Back in John chapter 1, the monogamous of God has revealed God to us. Do we have enough so that we know who God is and who Jesus is? Absolutely. 
That's why we, that's why we are committed to the sufficiency of Scripture. We don't have to have outside revelation in either what we need to believe or how we should act, how we should live. That just adds confusion. Calvin goes on, that that man who has duly profited under such teachers will be truly wise. In other words, the, the teaching of God's word, you're going to be wise and you're going to profit from it. And indeed, since they were appointed by God to be witnesses to us, as they have faithful to, faithfully discharged their duty, so it is our duty, on the other hand, to depend wholly on their testimony and to desire nothing more than what they have handed down to us, and especially because their pens were indeed guided by the sure providence of God, that they might not oppress us by an unlimited mass of narratives, and yet in making a selection might make known to us all that God knew to be necessary for us, who alone is wise and the only fountain of wisdom. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Peter's been restored to ministry, and he's been given this commission by God, shepherd my sheep. And John, again, is pointing us to Christ's sovereignty over that whole situation. Shepherd my sheep. Peter, I, I do know all things. Here's how you're going to die. Now keep following me. Follow me. This gospel has taught us so much about the Lord Jesus. No wonder it is referenced as this source by which men and women can be guided and boys and girls as well. So they may know Jesus and be converted, knowing and experiencing the light and the life of God in Christ. I pray this is true of you this morning, that no, come what may, you will follow Jesus because you love him. First John later on says, we, we love, why? Because he, he first loved us. Of course, what other response must we have than to turn and love Christ. He's given us everything. And we've been given everything in Christ. How could we do any, anything else? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this study through John. Uh, I confess the terror at preaching it sometimes. It's so rich. And we thank you for this, this last section of the last chapter all of the examples, applications that we can make and draw out legitimately from the text. Now, Lord, I pray that it's never merely an intellectual exercise, that we would take it to heart, that we would learn what it is to follow you, follow you wholeheartedly, and to love you more than these, whether the these are the things of the world or friendships, temporary and eternal or even the level of love of other brothers and sisters, that we would concentrate and be faithful, not, not having anxiety about other people, and that we would be satisfied with the, the sap that comes from your pure word. And we love you and we worship you alone. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.